and how are the children? Mindfully preparing all students to thrive. So before we get started with discussing the strategies to help students thrive, I would like to play a game. Imagine a goose in a bottle. Without breaking the bottle, how would you get the goose out of the bottle? Wait, before you answer that, I would like to say, I, I do this often, and the first time I did this, I heard a participant yell, I was just drink the goose, and I was lost. And he said, because it's gray goose. So just to give you guys, <laughs> to help you because we don't have as much time, I'm not talking about gray goose. So imagine a goose in the bottle. Without breaking the bottle, how would you get the goose out of the bottle? Think you have the answer? So before I reveal the answer, I would like to tell you a story. Among the most fabled tribes in Africa, no tribe was considered to be more fearsome, intelligent, and beautiful than the mighty Maasai. And so people found it very strange that the Maasai would walk past each other and greet each other by asking, and how are the children? And the traditional response, all the children are well. You see, the Maasai understood and the Maasai knows that the value of the children being well is a state of how their community is doing. So I think about this often, and I often ask myself, what would it be like if we were Maasai? If all of you were Maasai members, and we greeted each other daily by asking, and how are the children? With the response that all the children are well. I wonder when politicians make a decision impacting the community before they make a vote, or write a bill, they're asking, and how are the children? I wonder before any educational commissioner is making a decision, they're asking, and how are the children? I wonder before we decide to close any school down or remove any group of people and replace them if we're asking, and how are the children? Asking how are the children is simply stating that if the kids are well, if the children are well, our community is well, and we're doing well, and we're doing good, and things are great. The longevity of our people is dependent on the well-being of our students. We should be asking how are the children? We're all Maasai. We're all Maasai. And to ask that, we have to first start by telling the truth. My grandmother is an old black lady from the South, and she has all these sayings. And as a kid, I never understood most of the things that she said, but now as an adult, I relish in those moments. And she hasn't been with us for a while, but I think about her and I carry her with me all the time. My grandmother said, Terry, tell the truth, because truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. You must tell the truth. And she would say, because when you tell the truth, you shame the devil. I'm going to admit, I still don't know what that means, but it reminds me of my grandmother, so I thought that I would add that to my, my talk. <laughs> Truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. Here are my three truths. For these are all of our children. We shall profit by or pay for whatever they become. That's what James Baldwin said. <laughs> and when we say all the children, we mean all the children. The St. Louis activist Amy Hunter, which you guys will hear from tonight, stated in her original TED talk, or her first TED talk, that the success of our students is simply based on a zip code in which they live in. So if students live in zip code 63105, they're doing better than kids who live in zip code 63106. And the only difference between those students is simply a number. And we have to be concerned with that. We have to understand that these are all of our children. We'll profit by and pay for whatever they become. We have a law in Missouri that says that when one school district is unaccredited, those students get to go to and attend an adjacent school district. People didn't think that the students in Normandy or Riverview would ever attend student schools in Clayton and some of these other places. The system isn't broken. The system isn't broken. It's working absolutely as desired. But we have to change the question in the system, and we have to say that these are all of our children, and we'll profit by and pay for 
whatever they become. So we cannot simply be okay with the fact that certain kids are doing well anymore because at any moment these kids can be in our community and they can be in our school districts. So if we're doing something in the school district that I'm a part of, that some other school district isn't doing, then how do we create a system in Missouri that we share this? Here's the story that we have to understand as Missourians. Businesses are not going to come to Missouri if they do not have public education or systems and schools that are thriving and doing well so that their employees can attend. So when businesses are not coming to St. Louis because of the education, we have to all be concerned with that. For these are all of our children we'll profit by and pay for whatever they become. The second piece is that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. Educators, we have to tell the truth and let our new teachers know that when you're entering the school setting, you're not simply teaching math or science or social studies or language arts. So how do we build relationships, healthy relationships with students, and not relationships that are based on a deficit model? We can't feel sorry for students and think that they're going to thrive. We can't look at students and think that because they come from a single family or they come from an area in a neighborhood that we believe is poor and not rich in thought or innovation, that we have to do something for these students and that relationship is void of high expectations because that does nothing but reinforce the stereotype and the biases that we have as a system. So the relationships that we build must be based on high expectation, resources, support, and validation. Oprah Winfrey said that she interviewed 30,000 people on her show in 25 years. And this is what she knows for sure that all people want to be heard, that all people want to be seen, and all people want to know that they matter. How do we validate young people in our school setting today? I was having a conversation with my wife, and she's a language arts teacher, and I shared that our validation can, cannot simply be based on a test score. How do we validate young people in our school system today to the extent that they want to be in school because they know that they're heard, they know that they're cared for. When we ask the question, and how are the children, I think to myself, how are the children at Santa Fe, how are the children in Parkland, the children in Ferguson, the two children in Flint, Michigan, how are the children? How are we validating them, listening to them? supporting them. So these are my truths. Truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. But I don't want to simply state this gloomy educational future, because that's not the case. And here are some things that we can do as solutions. I want to start with self-care. NPR recently ran a story that said, Teachers are highly stressed out and why we should all be concerned. I'm the executive director of student services. I'm strongly advocating that my title be changed to the executive director of school services because we have to support our teachers. We cannot simply stand here and say and ask how are the children without asking and how are the teachers. Our teachers are wonderful people who are walking into schools every single day doing the best that they can and they're stressed out and they're needing support and we have to be able to support our teachers. So in my school district, we're heavily focused on self-care, increasing mindfulness and education for adults, yoga and education for adults. Teachers are taking self-care days because we know that you don't have to be sick to just need a break. So let's change those sick days to just self-care days. The other, piece that, the other piece that we're focusing on in my school district is social and emotional learning, looking at the five competencies, 
self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making skills, and relationship skills. And these skills are skills that employers are saying that all people need, all people need. So if we can fundamentally teach social and emotional skills from pre-K all the way through high school, then our students will be prepared for a future that is ready for them, jobs that don't exist. So how do we create a system where we're heavily focused on social and emotional learning and not just the academic pieces? So in Missouri, I challenge us to challenge the Board of Education to not simply accredit our schools based on test scores, but accredit our schools based on test scores as well as the social and emotional well-being of all of our students. As Emily shared with you guys, we know that trauma is very important, and our kids are coming to school experiencing trauma. And how do we support them? How do we support kids that are experiencing trauma in our system? We have to be focused on trauma. We know that students are coming to school, one in five students are coming to school with a mental health diagnosis. Many of you have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and we know that students are coming to school with at least two adverse childhood experiences in our classrooms. We cannot simply talk about these things and share data if we're not going to collectively as a community talk about how do we support these students and have interventions in place for the schools. The other piece I want to mention here is that we know that trauma can also be transmitted generationally. We see this in the literature with a wonderful book written by Dr. Joy DeGruy, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, but we also witness this with Jewish uh, young people who uh, parents went through the Holocaust. We know that trauma can be passed generationally. So when we talk about trauma, it cannot simply be a state of individuals at the educational level, but it has to be the community as a whole. The last piece that I want to talk about is restorative practices. We're seeing an increase in individuals talk about restorative practices and schools implement restorative practices in their schools as a way to curb suspensions. But I want to be very honest. Restorative practices and justice is more than curbing suspension. Restorative practice, restorative justice is about building relationships, healthy relationships with students and repairing harm when harm is done. So for schools who have eradicated suspensions in their school and they think that they're doing a restorative process, that's not necessarily the case if there's no relationship built and the harm that was created by that student is not repaired, right? So we can have restorative practices. It's not the absence of consequences. You can have consequences and still have a restorative community. And I would also say that the restorative practices and justice in schools cannot simply be for the students. So when the teachers or the counselors or the social workers or school resource officers are not behaving nicely to one another. That impacts the whole school system. So the restorative practice that we're advocating for is a school-wide system. This is how we mindfully prepare all students to thrive. So remember earlier, I asked you to play that game with me. Imagine a goose in a bottle. Without breaking the bottle, how would you get the goose out of the bottle? So it was a trick. So here's the answer. I ask you to imagine the goose in the bottle. The fact of the matter is, the goose was never in the bottle. You simply put the goose in the bottle because of your imagination. And here's what I'm asking you guys to do with me today. Imagine a school system in America where we ask daily and how are the children, and we responded without a doubt that all the children are well.